All right, super. <laughs> well, here we are again. Today is uh, class eight. Um, we're doing pen and ink, of course, uh, for the second time. And I've got a couple of exercises that we'll go through um, during the, actually, I, uh, three if I can uh, fit them in and two for certain, um, to wrap up pen and ink. And like I said last week, there are so many options. It was kind of hard to to figure out exactly where I wanted to take you on this. So um, I, I've kind of targeted a couple of things that I think will be useful for drawing regardless. So even if you're just following along with a pencil and paper and you're not doing pen and ink, uh, don't worry about that at all. Um, these things will apply no matter what. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Let's see. Um, so, so glad that you guys are all hanging in there and, and we're uh, getting through all these different types of drawing media. I know that we've, we've been covering quite a lot. Um, and so I wanted to, to backtrack a little bit. And, and uh, if you remember from the very first class, we were talking about, you know, the analogy of going on this journey and that uh, Belle Fouche, which I've learned how to pronounce now <laughs> in South Dakota, which is this, the geological, geographical center of, of the United States, was sort of our, our um, imaginary destination. And, and I was just saying, you know, come along with me. I'm going to take you through all these different types of drawing media. Um, and we're, we're going to head to, you know, South Dakota, in, in other words. Um, and that rather than you just sort of having to fight through and try all these media by yourself, that I would sort of give you a little bit of direction. Well, a number of people have been sending me their artwork over the last few weeks. And one of the things that they're encountering, of course, is that in the course of the time that we have, um, it's difficult to sort of get any level of mastery on any of these drawing media. So I wanted to reiterate a little bit how I was looking at these classes for the summer um, and, and how we're going to sort of proceed from here. So um, I did find out that it's 2,019.1 miles from Chappaquiddick Island uh, all the way to Belfouche. So this is a 31 hour drive, which is even more hours than you and I are going to be spending in class together this summer. So I thought that was a great analogy because as we're going along, I'm basically saying, hey, we're stopping at all these little towns. We're trying these different things. We're, we're heading to Belle um, Fouche with the idea that, you know, we'll have covered all these, this drawing media and I'll have given you a lot of information about drawing techniques and, and approaches. But, you know, uh, mastery will happen in, in months and years to come. It, it won't happen during the course of the summer. Although for those of you who have actually been drawing already and, and are practicing during the course of the summer, you'll be getting better and better. So what is happening, I think, to a lot of people is that, you know, you, you, you're adventurous, every single one of you. you. You got off the sofa, you signed up for the drawing course, you, you know, you're drawing with me every week. But the difference is that if you're just sitting on the sofa thinking about drawing, you know, in your mind, you're able to do all these amazing things. Once you actually start drawing, you start to realize that, hey, you can do some things and other things are problematic. So just as a bit of an illustration, I, I mapped out how to get from Chappaquiddick to Belfouche. And so we are somewhere right around Toledo right about now in the eighth class. So we've got a ways to go. Um, and my idea with the class is that sort of I'm guiding you to South Dakota so that you don't get lost. We'll all go together. Um, when you get there, you've got a couple of choices. You can either hop on a plane and, and go back home and, and not worry about some of this drawing stuff again or just, you know, do the things that, that you enjoy doing. Or you can take the trip sort of return journey or, or your own journey where you're stopping and trying uh different techniques or, or maybe exploring pen and ink or charcoal or pencil, whatever, a bit more. Now, I personally don't draw in every single one of these media that I'm showing you. You know, I might draw in them sometimes, but not all the time. So, so don't feel pressured or overwhelmed with all of the stuff I'm showing you. Hopefully the drawing information itself sort of applies across the board, but don't let the speed and all the information about the different drawing media, you know, get too, get too overwhelming. So once again, 
Elizabeth Whelan says, observation and practice are the key to mastery. So technique is a matter of practice. Whichever drawing media you pick, pen and ink or charcoal or whatever it happens to be. Um, interesting drawings do depend on observation. You know, the more you look at things and you more the, the more you try to figure out what a good scene would be, the better your drawing results will be. And then accuracy. You know, people have been, you know, the still life, the faces, the, the bridge, all of that. Um, it's difficult to get accuracy right out of the, um, you know, it, it would be like saying, hey, I'm going to go to, to, uh, to Belfouche without um, any map and any direction that I just want to get there and everything is going to be fine. And you find out, no, actually, it's a bit of a slog to go 2,000 miles. <laughs> and so, you know, observation and practice have to happen all the time and, and you will uh, improve as you go. So let me also say something about, about self-critique. I don't particularly like, uh, you know, artist critiques in general, where somebody puts the art up on the wall and then everybody sort of says all the things they see that they think are wrong with it, because I don't think that's all that, that helpful. What I think is more helpful is for each person to develop their own eye, to look at their artwork and go, hey, you know, some of this stuff worked really well, but, you know, these other things perhaps uh, are not so great. Because if we could always draw or paint everything just right, then we would only need to do one drawing or painting and we could just say, hey, we're done. We're on to the next thing, right? But every artist, and especially professional artists, we, we hit our head against this brick wall all the time. We're always finding things that are wrong. We're always trying to correct. And then for the next time that we go through that particular subject, we're saying, okay, this one thing is giving me a little trouble. I need to concentrate and really understand why, why that isn't working. So this is what I mean about observation and practice. But I have to say congratulations and well done to every single one of you, because you did get up off the couch. You did sign up for Summer of Drawing. You are drawing. And this is this is making you better than everybody who's just sitting there thinking about it in terms of your ability. So, you know, have a lot of faith in yourself. Look at your work and, and you know, compliment yourself on the things that worked out. And for the things that didn't, you know, uh, those, that tells you exactly where the practice has to go. So just a little bit of a recap, the drawing media we've been talking about so far, pencils are easy to work with, portable, and also erasable. And we can use them for shading or line or both. Uh, because of the variety of lead softnesses, uh, they're not as uh, dark as charcoal. So charcoal, if you like those darks, uh, they need a little bit more control. So you might want to practice uh, drawing in pencil if you're, if you're sort of new to drawing um, first, as well as working in the charcoal. Great for those uh, rich darks. And there's a huge wide tonal variety, as well as a variety of, of lead softness. So shading you can do beautifully with charcoal. When you get to pen and ink, Shading has to be done a different way. We're sort of back to what, what some of those techniques we did in pencil, hatching, cross hatching. Uh, we can add stippling in, which you can't really do in pencil so well. Um, and it, it's also difficult to remove the lines, but you can get some really nice effects, thin and thick lines, uh, you know, uh, various different sort of hatching combinations that add texture and interest to whatever you're doing, regardless of the type of pen you're doing. But the same principles apply to drawing across the board. A good composition is so important, uh, and that's based on good design. And so we get that good design by using a viewfinder, at least to start off with, so we can isolate you know, what it is that we're trying to draw and what's going to be interesting. And the notan, which is that little uh, black and white sketch that you do that just identifies where the dark areas are in, in the uh, scene you're looking at, the dark and the light. And is that an interesting pattern to you? Do you like the way that sort of looks? So someone asked me last week and I forgot to address it. What is the difference between a notan and a rough sketch? Well, if you're going to be very uh, sort of distinct about it, the no tan is just the very, very simple drawing that only has the dark and the light aspect to it, just the, uh, the black and white. And a rough sketch, you're starting to add a bit more detail. Now, in practice, I have to say that my my no tans veer into rough sketches. You know, I'm sort of doing this tiny little thing. I'm working out where the darks are, but in order to do that, I've got to draw in some of those items to make sure I've got stuff in the right place. So mine do sort of tend to move towards a rough sketch. I would say that it, it don't worry about, um, you know, the, from an academic point of view, are you doing this or are you doing that? 
as long as whatever little drawing you're doing is, is, is assessing the dark and light patterns in, in the scene you're looking at, you're fine. So um, just don't, you know, if you're starting to draw in that little um, rectangle or whatever it is, I would say stop and put all that effort into your bigger um, picture. But it doesn't really, you know, don't get too tied up on that stuff. And the other thing, of course, is looking at your subject, taking some time to look at the subject and say, you know, for the drawing media I'm going to use, um, you know, do I need to use shading? And if so, how am I going to accomplish it based on whether I'm using pencils or charcoal and pen and ink? So I also wanted to preview what we're going to be doing next week. So you can have some supplies ready if you wanted to. But so you also understand a little, not everyone's heard this term before, the um, trois couleurs or uh, trois crayons, which really just means three colors or three pencils. It just sounds really good in French. <laughs> and of, of course, this was something that was developed by... Um, uh, or popularized, I should say, by um, French and Flemish artists. Uh, I guess in the late 1600s, early 1700s, you saw a lot of this. So Antoine Watteau was one of them. He, here's one of his sketches here. Uh, Peter Paul Rubens uh, did a lot of this. And what it is, is basically you're taking that idea of the black and white and using um, some line work and some shading, but you're also adding in another color, one more color, a red or a terracotta, or, a, you know, sort of a, usually a reddish brown of some sort works really well. Sometimes people even go towards a pink color for that third color. And I find it works best on a toned paper. So you can do it on white paper and just not worry about the white or use the white only for blending. But it just looks a little bit nicer for toned paper. So if you don't have any toned paper, but you might have some of these pencils to try this technique, um, you can always use a paper bag. Uh, I love using the paper bags just for rough sketches because they're, it's easy and simple and it's exactly the right value to work on. So I find that that is really useful. Um, so I'm going to be using Conte Crayon and Conte Crayon is just a, um, uh, it's not really like a soft pastel. It's kind of somewhere in between a colored pencil and a pastel and it allows it has a little bit of a chalky feel and allows me to do something sort of like what you see on Watteau is doing here but there are many many ways to apply this method and it starts to give you some interesting looking and kind of realistic skin tones so for those of you who are interested in doing figure drawing this is a really good way to sort of work into that so we'll do a couple of weeks with using the um the three colors method uh, on a variety of subjects, not just on people, but we'll definitely be doing some people as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit, for those of you who are sort of struggling with trying to get things to look like they are in real life, and, and talk a little bit about how to go about that, both from real life and also from, um, from working on, say, like a printout. Um, because this stuff will make doing people a lot easier. So we'll talk, we're talking today about pen and ink, but we're also talking about how to draw people and how to draw figures. And without me going into sort of a big anatomical discussion this time, I just wanted to show some ways to go about drawing people that doesn't necessarily rely on the anatomy knowledge up front. It relies heavily on observation and measuring. So one method is called the site size drawing method, and it's used for painting as well as drawing. It's an academic way of drawing. You probably remember that I mentioned academic drawing earlier on. And it's a, it's a way of holding up your paper um, or putting it on an easel or doing, or in this case, a painting um, in such a way that the subject matter on your, on your canvas or on your paper is exactly the si same size as the object appears to you in the distance. So obviously this requires a few things. It requires you setting up your artwork and your, um, your paper or whatever in such a way that you can easily see both side by side. Um, you need to be at a distance from your subject so that it's small enough or large enough to appear where you want it to on the page. The benefit of doing a site size method like this is of course that it, you're not trying to um, interpret proportions. It's difficult to look at something small like on your phone or much larger like the scene around you and then either cram it onto a little page or, or enlarge it. So the site size method is one way to go about that. Now you can do this um, sort of uh, at home, so to speak, um, by either having 
your paper or your sketch pad set up, for example, next to a computer screen if you had an image there. Or what I would prefer you to do to start off with is to maybe print out um, a, a version of whatever, if, if you're copying a photo or something of that nature, print it out or copying a piece of artwork and then have it side by side on your page so that if you're trying to duplicate something, you're, you have exactly the same uh, proportions from, from uh, what you're copying to what you're trying to draw. Now, you know that I prefer everyone drawing from life and, and measuring with angles and doing all of that kind of good stuff. But there's a lot to be learned from being able to duplicate artwork or duplicate a photo or, uh, um, or a sketch, whatever you're trying to do, um, because it, it's another way of observing. So I don't think one is better than the other. I think it's very useful to be able to do both. So another method which um, we're going to use today, actually, is drawing using a grid. So this is um, an Albrecht Dürer print of, uh, of a very, very complicated way of um, using this grid and drawing it out on a page. We're not going to be doing anything quite like that. <laughs> but this is um, drawing using a grid is something that has been done for, for centuries. In this particular case, um, this artist has done a, a sketch of his wife and he wants to enlarge it and put it and do a painting of it. So basically, as long as he, he has um, regular markings for, in this case, squares, then he can do squares that are at any size on his canvas and transfer whatever's inside that square over to his canvas, and he will have um, essentially blown up the image. So he, this guy must have been doing something large. He has a lot of uh, little squares. He wanted um, a lot of exactness, especially around the face. And uh, Tintoretto, a lot of his sketches show that he would have done these small sketches and then wanted to enlarge them or place this uh, character somewhere in his painting um, and would have used that same method to transfer from one place to another. And here are a couple of different ways that artists I just found on the internet um, have used the grid method. In one case, um, up on the left-hand side, that person wanted to, to use that photo reference go ahead and start drawing um, you know, their, own, their own head using this particular method. Now, I will say a couple of things here. I recommend that if you're going to do something like this, that the lines you draw on your paper be as light as you can possibly make them, um, in, or do dotted lines, or even just like a few little marks. Um, if you draw very heavily, it will be difficult to come back later and get rid of those lines. Also, I strongly suggest that rather than this person with a horse who did um, quite a bit of drawing within that area, that if you do just a very light sketch to put everything down in place and then erase most of the lines, um, you know, perhaps you can still see a little bit of the grid, but not an awful lot, then it will be, it'll be easier later on not to have those lines of the grid existing underneath. Of course, for people who are painting, they're painting right over the top of it, so it's not quite so important. And then over on the right, this is an example of somebody who's blown up a smaller image. So I frequently use the grid method. If I am taking a sketch I have done to a canvas, um, I'll just quickly mark off some lines, probably not anywhere near as many lines as, as we see right here. Um, and from that, I will, I will enlarge, I'll, I'll do bigger squares on my canvas and enlarge from there. Let's see. So, whoops, let me, I'm just having a little trouble forwarding here. Ah, there we go. So I wanted to, to talk just a minute about the Rialto Bridge that we um, drew last, last week, because I, I had a number of people contact me to show me what their uh, work was or to tell me where their problems um, were. And the problems were universally with the boats. <laughs> you know, everyone was doing really great pictures of the, of the Rialto Bridge. And I was really pleased to see how, how well the angles were coming out. And, you know, I could really see the effort there. But the boats were very difficult for folks. And I, believe me, boats are difficult to draw and paint in general. They are each so different from each other. Um, how they sit in the water, what that water line looks like, 
you know, what they look like from above or from the side. They're one of the most complicated objects you could possibly uh, draw. And when they're moving at the same time, like they were when we were watching the webcam, makes it even more difficult. So when you have a lot of boats, like uh, on this photo right here, it's a little easier because you have a lot of things sort of going in the same direction. Makes it easier to do a bunch of shapes that are sort of the same size, you know, sort of heading in the same direction. But if you are in a situation like this and you're trying to draw live something this complicated, this is what I mean when I say I strongly recommend, you know, drawing the scene, getting that right. And if you're not sure about the boats, do a few sketches of boats over to the side to see, you know, how does that work and where are you going to put them in your drawing? But there's no doubt that, that drawing any kind of boat like this is, is complicated. And especially we don't even see gondolas very much, you know, locally. We see dinghies, we see motorboats, we see sailboats. Um, but, you know, here, here are two boats right here, this I don't even know what you would call that orange gondola, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> over here on the right. Um, so you're trying to deal with a, an unfamiliar object that's going by its speed. You're trying to draw it in the correct perspective. It's definitely problematic. Now, if you have an opportunity on a scene like this to, to um, try to you know, practice a bit more, you might be able to take a photo. And then if you do, I would suggest drawing a grid over perhaps a printout, and then looking at each of these sections one by one and seeing where do these boats actually fit? Uh, you know, what angles are, um, is the area of the water line where, where the edge of the boat meets, meets the water? What angle is the uh, edge that runs around the top? How far in can I see in the boat? For the boats further away, it's like those teacups from earlier on. I really can't see inside. But the closer those boats come to me, the more I can see inside the boat and see what's going on inside there. But I just want to reassure everybody, boats are very tough, very difficult to, um, to draw. You're doing an amazing job with all of the work you're putting into this. And don't let those sorts of details get you down in any sense. So I also thought I'd um, just say this, was a, this is an example of, you know, when you've got fewer boats, you don't have so much to work with. All I can suggest is try to check those angles with your pencil, hold that pencil up, you know, look at the, the general object, sketch as quickly as you can on your page if you're sketching live, you know, the general shape of what you've got going on, and then don't worry about the details at the, at the time. Perhaps do a couple of extra sketches out to the side. This is the sort of thing that takes practice, but I just wanted to go through that. All right, now on to people. <laughs> so what we're going to do today, we're going to start off by drawing this guy in uh, pen and ink. And I picked this because this fellow is, is obviously very stark. Um, and I, I want you to not concentrate on detail. So the goal is for about, let's see what we have for time. For about the next uh, five minutes, I want you to draw this fellow. We've got a grid here. Um, Go ahead and lay out a grid on your own page of nine squares, and then do what you can to try to just draw, try to ignore the fact that you're drawing a face, and look only at the lines where the dark and the light meet, and just draw them out here over on the right hand, uh, oh, sorry, um, on your page as, as they are on the right hand side. And then what you'll be doing, I'm just going to forward so you can see what we're doing next. We'll be just filling in those dark areas. But for the moment, I'm going to go back here so you have reference. So just go ahead and start sketching this out. Do a, a little grid. It'll have nothing in it, but just the lines, just like these yellow lines. And then by just looking at each square one at a time over here on the left, See if you can draw in as accurately as possible where the, the edge of the dark and the light that meets, where does that fall within each one of those nine squares? This takes a little getting used to. So I've picked this guy because this is a pretty high contrast picture. But it also allows me, while you're sketching away, to talk a little bit about how people and boats and cups and all of these other objects, pictures and, and fabric, they are all a matter of shape. Now, of course, everything that we look at is not high contrast like this. When you're looking at a person, and we'll be talking about this in just a few minutes, when you're looking at a person who is not highly um, 
uh, lit in high contrast like this. It is difficult to figure out what you're going to do with all of those middle tones, with those middle values. And particularly if the entire face is very light, what happens is we, that's when we start doing what I call the Egyptian thing of outlining everything. Everything gets an outline. But in real life, those lines that we draw are really made up by those areas where the dark and the light meet. They're not really lines in reality. The lines are what we use to indicate that something is happening there. So pen and ink is really useful because it allows you to step away from that information that's in your brain of uh, this is what an eye looks like. And it has this round thing in the middle and it always has an eyelid and it always has an eyebrow that looks like this. And it allows you to step away from that and look at the person you are actually drawing. So someone asked me a couple of weeks ago, and I thought it was a good idea. And we'll be doing it next week um, to do, you know, could I show them how to draw a generic uh, like eye and a generic nose and such. And we definitely will. In fact, we'll be using Michelangelo's David and all of these, um, these body parts you see hanging behind me. Um, we'll be using them to, whoops, to, uh, to sort of do a generic, um, uh, various different generic features. But if you think about it, there really isn't such thing as a generic feature. Every nose is different from every other nose. Even Michelangelo's David's, uh, whoops, other side, um, nose is, is a particularly unique one to that sculpture. So it's so important that we don't default to formula and to going, hey, I know how to draw a nose. I'm going to put this nose in because it won't be the nose of the person you're drawing. So that gets me back to what we're doing right now, which is establishing these shapes, these dark and light shapes, or these other areas we see, they could be mid-tones, but we're starting with dark and light right now because it's easy to see. Um, and saying, what shapes does this face create where the light and the dark meet? How, how you know, those lines that we see, what exactly are they? So let me just uh, get onto the next picture so you can see. So what I've done in this particular case, I'm, I'm saying, well, I've, you know, after I got my general lines in place, I got rid of my grid. You can erase the lines or you can just leave them there. It doesn't matter. I'm just sort of showing you. And then I went and filled this in really roughly. And as you can see, it's basically black and white, except I realized, hmm, what was I going to do behind the top of his head? So I did a little hatching and a little shading that just allowed that to, to change. But what I didn't do is I didn't put a line underneath the, the pupil and iris, for example. And I didn't put lines in at the other side of the nose where I didn't really see them. And I didn't put uh, lines in even for the ears because I was squinting when I did this, trying to find the, the shapes. Now, I could probably have put a few more in on the right side under his eye. I can, I, uh, now that I'm squinting at that, I'm like, hmm, I could have done a bit more over there. So, it's not like I'm saying that this is, you know, the perfect, the perfect way to do it. But you can see how just from dark and light shapes, and there's no doubt that somebody knows that's a face. And that is the, that's the place I want you to start with drawing faces, is not worrying so much about the anatomy, but spending a great deal of time worrying about what you actually see in front of you. So if you just want to go ahead and wrap that up, we're going to move on to another exercise very similar. If, you, if this is the first time you've tried working from a grid, it does take a little time to sort of assess where, where everything is within each square. So what I tend to do is I tend to mentally divide it into quarters, you know, sort of like when we did those notans earlier, and we put the little tick marks at the middle on each side. I sort of take each one almost like a little, little notan and go, okay, you know, like, the corner of that eye is kind of about the middle and the eyebrow is sort of a third, edge of the eyebrow is sort of a third of the way up. And that kind of gives me a ballpark of where to go. Now, one of the reasons why that artist earlier drew so many squares and so many lines was, of course, you can get a lot more accuracy the more draw lines you draw. But I think that there's, there's a lot to be said for not going too crazy with the, with the grid. Um, you do want to rely on your own powers of observation. You do want to use your angles just like you would, you know, if we were doing this live. Um, 
to, to double check, you know, how those eyebrows go, you know, how, how does the top of the eyebrow go to the top of the ear? You know, how, how does that really work? Is it, you know, it's about level, you know, uh, what's the angle of the t- of the eyebrow on the left? What's the angle of the eyebrow on the right? Et cetera, et cetera. So you're sort of using a combination of the different methods to get you to the end result that you're after. And the end result is a reasonably accurate drawing of this guy, but only using the dark and the light. So this is a really good example, actually, of, a, of what a no-tan is, because you've got this interesting dark and light pattern that's happening, but it also creates the sense of the scene without you even having to go any further. Okay, we're going to move on to the next one. So in this case, we're going to draw this girl's head. Now, we probably won't get uh, very far with this because I've got something else I want you to, to work on, but I want you to at least get started with the basics. So in this case, I haven't put up my sketch, um, but go ahead and do a little nine by, uh, sorry, a little nine um, square grid and start marking out, if nothing else, just those lines of where, where do the dark and light patterns happen in this particular face. And I tend to, with something like this, because it doesn't really matter where, where you start uh, when you're using a grid, I have a tendency to start in, start in the upper left and kind of work my way over. But when I do get to the face, I pay a little bit of attention because you can get carried away um, and, and the proportions can, you know, it doesn't really matter if the proportions on the hair aren't exactly right and you didn't get the lines, you know, just perfect. But when you get to the placement of the eyes and nose and such, um, even though we're looking at them as light and dark, we still want to get them in the right place. So once again, squinting, taking time to squint while you're working at this and try to eliminate all that information that you see in her eye. And of course, I've got this nice yellow line running right through the middle of her mouth. So that, you know, that's a little distracting too. And this is a sort of um, thing that I think uh, when you're finished, you can go back and look at the PDF I send around and possibly uh, do some more work on this particular image. I think it would, will help a lot. Uh, this is a lot more complicated than the fellow. But the idea of moving beyond that, uh, that thought about line and just looking at where the dark and the light edges meet will help quite a bit. Now on uh, her face, you can see really clearly that terminal shadow, that terminus that I was um, talking about uh, before when we did the still life and such. And that where that line falls and how sharp it is really defines so much about a person's face and about the shape of their head and about how their cheekbones look or in this particular case, the cleft in her chin. So all of that information um, can be found by looking at how those shadows fall. And a high contrast picture like this is a good way to practice it. However, as we'll be talking about in just a minute here, um, people don't walk around looking high contrast like this all the time. In fact, most pictures you take, especially if you end up using a flash or whatever, will do the opposite, will fill a lot of um, light into your picture and it can be difficult to know what to do. So we'll just a couple more minutes on this and then we'll move along. But I wanted to make sure we had uh, more than one face to try in this method. I think the most complicated part of of uh, drawing somebody like this in particular is that it's so difficult to look at that left eye um, or the eye that's on the left and not think of it as an eye. It's really, that takes a lot of mental strain just to keep squinting that at that and not drawing lines where you don't see them. Now, in this particular case, she's got um, eyeliner running all the way around. So obviously there is a line at the bottom, but look at the, her nose, for example, the, um, on the left-hand side, that nostril is defined only by a very exact shape and not at all by the outside. There's nothing, there is no line that you can really see. Well, you can see a tiny bit of shading, very, very light, but I wouldn't draw that in. Only the, the business of how that shadow falls on the other side of the face tells us something about the size and the shape of the nose. But this kind of observation, it really is, is key to doing uh, good drawing. Okay, let's go ahead and wrap this one up because you'll have time to work on this uh, yourself uh, later after I send around the PDF. And let's move on to an, another aspect of drawing and pen and ink. And that is Charles Dana Gibson. So 
Charles Dana Gibson, one of my favorite, favorite illustrators ever, and probably uh, well known to quite a number of people. He, um, his heyday was really about around the 1900s, uh, probably the 1910 to uh, 1920 was when he, he really was big, did an awful lot of, of these uh, women who were very famous um, uh, in terms of back in the day, uh, Evelyn Nesbitt, for example, and other film stars and well-known known celebrities. Um, he did these stylized, uh, very sort of languorous looking women with their hair piled up and created a style that people tried to emulate. So on one hand, he had um, actresses and celebrities that he was uh, using as models for the look, but then it, it created those, those illustrations were uh, duplicated in, in newspapers and magazines. And then people tried to look like a Gibson girl. So it was sort of um, chicken and an egg scenario. But one of the things, the reason I wanted to show you this kind of pen and ink work is because this takes that idea of looking at the dark and the light, but breaks those areas down into much, much more subtle values. But the reason why it's so effective was the way he followed the form with the lines. So I want you to just look for a moment at how he treated the area around the eyes. Now, just like that woman we looked at a minute ago, this, this woman's eyes are pretty well defined, um, upper and lower lashes. But the rest of it, you don't really have an, a line for an eyelid or, or a line that separates the dark area from the light area um, in the middle of the nose. But you have these very, very light lines, very light directional lines that represent that mid-tone. And another thing that you don't have is a lot of lines everywhere. There are large open areas left where the light is hitting so that you don't sort of overdo the darks. And that I think is the hardest part to maintain with something like this. When you're doing the hair, it's a little bit easier. You can get, you get a little bit carried away and only a few highlights are needed. It's mostly the darks. But when you're doing the face, it has to be the other way around. It is better to err on the side of having more light and less dark than, than the other way around. So here's another illustration of his. Once again, he went crazy on the hair, beautiful. You know, looks like it has waves and highlights and this, that, and the other. But on the face, he has very, very little in terms of, of detail. And this is really key in pen and ink to having a good effect because you can't, unless you're going to dilute your inks or something like that, you don't really have that opportunity to do subtle shading. And with a woman's face or with a child's face in particular, um, or somebody younger, um, the more lines you put in, the more lines it looks like they have, unless they're very, unless you're very, very careful. So in this particular case, he did um, something which one of my um, uh, fellow artists said that he loves, he loves doing paintings of people in profile because there's only one eye <laughs> and one ear <laughs> to worry about and one nostril. And so it just makes life an, an awful lot easier. But also look at those directional lines around the chin, directional lines around the back of the neck, um, and even around the eyes. Just, you know, it's something to keep in mind, kind of the same way we were talking about growing objects and, and how they grow and sort of the, the direction of trees and tree limbs and this, that, and the other. The same sort of thing um, applies to people. So Charles Dana Gibson is well known, of course, for those images such as we just saw, but he also did an awful lot of loose sketching and he did uh, il illustrations for books and magazines for, for decades and did all sorts of things. So this kind of very loose sketch is what most of us manage to do if we're doing a, a sketch of a person, um, which is loose lines, you know, he hasn't really modulated that light and dark in the way that uh, he did on those larger, very careful drawings. I will tell you that every single one of these, he did pencil sketches underneath them first. So when we look at this, we tend to get blown away by that ink work. But when you see them in real life, you'll realize that he did pencil sketches underneath so that he would know where everything was going. And then when he went and put his lines down, he could be kind of free about it because he had this uh, under, underpinning to work with. And then he did, also did um, numerous other subjects for, for book illustration and this, that, and the other. I wanted to show you this one in particular because if you remember from uh, last week, I had some illustrations of a, of a modern day 
Frankenstein uh, book by Bernie Wrightson, where he had tried to emulate that sort of etching feel by having the line work follow the form, follow the, the cloth to, to give different impressions. And um, Gibson's work is, is very much of that sort. You know, the back of the chair, you get the feeling that it, you know, probably pushes in a little bit when the guy sits back. Um, and you also see how he's used directional shading, but it's not careful for, um, for the, the suit itself. What is careful is paying attention to not letting things get too dark everywhere. So if you take a second and just squint at this, you'll see that he's got some good light values running all the way through this, along the top of the pants, the top of the chair, the top of the arm, you know, the, the lapels, so that you have some differentiation. So when you're working in pen and ink, this is something to keep in mind. There's a tendency to go, just like charcoal, too dark, too fast. It's better to go ahead and do your, your sketching or your cross hatching, and then add more lines in going in a different direction or over the top, rather than going for the darks right away. I just wanted to include this one too. This is one of his more careful illustrations that he did, um, which is, is uh, I think it's called The Tourists um, Seeing New York. And uh, it's just wonderful, all the various different expressions he has. But he's using a dip pen to do these and also, uh, also using um, a brush. He's, he has a, a little bit of both going on. But he's using an extremely fine point for the, the faces, and particularly the faces of the women, and keeping an extremely light touch. So that all it's, although you get that sense of following the form, and, and following the direction of the person, you're also, it's not overwhelming. The fellow over on the left, he's gone a little heavier on the marks, maybe a, a little bit darker um, of a pen nib as well, because that fellow is obviously a little bit more florid. He doesn't have to be so delicate. Um, and look at all the varying, uh, both the pressure, the, the, uh, the nib size, the amount of ink that's going down. Just look at the difference between all of that clothing, even the direction of the lines, for example, in the um, woman that's second from the right, um, how that differentiates from the woman beside her um, or, the, or the woman with the, the more light suit. So you don't, when it comes to pen and ink, you only have a uh, line in order to be able to show you these differences in, in value. But if you regulate those lines, wow, what you can achieve. So what we are going to achieve <laughs> is we're going to spend the rest of the class today drawing this lady right here. And I'm pretty sure this was Evelyn Nesbitt that he was using as a model for this, but I'm not positive. So rather than just sort of throwing you right in there to the wolves, I'd like you to go ahead and use the same sort of construction method that we used for those images earlier. So start off by doing a little uh, nine square um, grid and mark in there to the best of you can, the best that you can, just in pencil to start with. I've got them marked uh, dark here, but that's just to show you what's going on. But just in pencil, get those basic lines of where this girl's head is uh, into, into this particular um, grid work. Because although Charles Dana Gibson was probably drawing this not using a grid and not in this way. He would, you know, have he would have had a photograph or he would have had the person in front of him, probably a photograph that he was working from. Um, and he would have had a chance to draw this out a little bit more in a little more detail. But in order to duplicate this, in order for us to learn from Charles Dana Gibson, in other words, um, it's let's get it let's get the proportions about right uh, to start with. So give yourself just a few minutes. Um, we'll spend about, hmm, probably about five minutes just sort of getting this person's head in place. Now, the reason I want you to copy this drawing rather than sort of doing your own version, although you can, because I can't see what you're doing. You could be drawing anything at this point. Elephants, I wouldn't have any idea. Um, but there's a lot to be learned from following the strokes of a master artist, of actually trying to make your strokes duplicate what this particular artist did. So it is my hope that you know, you'll, you'll do the grid and get the basic layout of how this head looks. And then we'll start it here in class, but spend some time, and you might even want to you know, start again when, when you don't have the pressure of time, um, to actually 
try to follow the lines that, you know, of course it won't be exact, but get the idea that you're Charles Dana Gibson and you're using this, this uh, probably a dip pen, um, but you could do this with a marker. You can do this with whatever. You can even do it in pencil. It, it doesn't have to be in, in pen. But you're trying to get this idea of the directional strokes. And then when you get to the face, you're trying to get the idea of really being able to regulate how heavy you're pressing the, the pen or how heavy you're pressing the uh, the pencil. Now you can, if you've got a variety of nibs or a variety of pencils, you can switch to a harder nib or to a, a thinner nib or um, you know a lighter pencil or whatever. But I think it's really useful to be able to work out how did Charles Dana Gibson do it. Um, and this is the value to copying artwork by the masters. It's not because you're going to end up doing work that looks like Char Charles Dana Gibson, but some of that knowledge that you acquire while you're actually copying this will get lodged in your head and it will come out in your way when you're doing your own work. Um, let's see, I'm just keeping track of the time to make sure you've got plenty of time to work on this. I know I'm usually rushing you through things, so I wanted to make sure that Okay. The other thing that's kind of fun to do is to is to look up some of the um, of the photographs from the time period of the people that Charles Dana Gibson was using as his models, because I mean he really did stylize them. He made them into these you know perfect images, and they did have a great deal of this languid quality. Was you know something that uh, you know he it's sort of the um, you know, you have all the time in the world and everything is luxurious. Your hair is luxurious. Your, your clothing is lu luxurious, but you go out there and you play tennis with your little tennis racket or whatever, but you still look perfect with your hair and this, that, and the other. It was, it was definitely aspirational. And a lot of people try to emulate that look in one way or another, but the people themselves, when you, when you look at the photographs of the people that he went from, you can see how he did this sort of stylized work. And artists working in pen and ink um, have, have a tendency um, to not worry so much about trying to make something realistic. Like, you know, in charcoal, you can get that really realistic looking. You can get that shading. But in pen and ink, there's an opportunity to sort of put your own spin on how you're drawing. So whether you're someone like Edward Gorey, who did those... Uh, you know, those opening credits for, for PBS Mystery back in the day. I have a number of his prints. And I'm a bit of a fan of his. And he did these very odd looking people um, that were very distinctly his own. Or whether you're doing, you know, something like Charles Dana Gibson or whether you're drawing comic books, it doesn't really matter. Pen and ink allows you to take what is essentially uh, a human form and those features and using that information, uh, turn it into your, your very own style of work. And so, you know, when I was speaking earlier about, you know, coming back from South Dakota and stopping at the little towns. So you might decide, for example, that pen and ink is something you would like to explore. So you're stopping basically at the town of pen and ink or the town of, of uh, Trois Couleurs or whatever it happens to be. And it's worth poking around and seeing what other artists have done and, and uh, you know, taking a little time to copy a master drawing or two. You know, you don't have to do a lot of them, but, you know, just to kind of give you an, an idea of where to get started and then take something like a photograph, perhaps of a person that you know, and try to try to draw them in the style of Charles Dana Gibson using that same type of technique or in the style of Edward Gorey. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, but the idea is, is enlarging what you think drawing or artwork is um, by the limits or the limitations of the, of the medium. So, so you can't, well, you, I shouldn't say you can't, you can make very, very realistic pen and ink drawings. It is entirely possible. It's entirely possible to do it with stippling and a combination of shading and this, that, and the other. But it's not necessarily the go-to. Uh, usually people use it more for sketchy things or for pulling out the quality of ink work itself, which is just amazing because you, you can carry something like this off.
Now, I'm going to just, at this point, I'm going to go back to the image without the grid up because I think it's a little distracting so that you can uh, finish up your drawing from here. Now, anybody who's, who's going, ah, you just took my grid away, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You'll have to make it up from here by using the angle thing and double checking your angles. Um, but uh, in part, the grid is useful, it's a useful way to get started, but it's not something that we, whoops, we necessarily um, you know, want to rely on. You definitely, someone said, do you have to use the grid? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I tend to use a, a grid only actually when I'm transferring things to, to Canvas. But it is a way, it is definitely a way to quickly get the, the general lines or, or the general placement of objects or features or whatever onto your page before you go uh, forward. So what I'm trying to do during the course of this summer is show you lots of different ways to go about doing things. Um, I tend to do, I tend to use the angle method that I've been showing you from the start, where, you know, I'll start with a feature or two and then I'll double check um, their relationship to each other by, like, for example, uh, right here, I would go for the bottom of the left-hand side of the nose to the outside of the eye, and then I would check the bottom of the left-hand side of the nose to the outside of the mouth, and I would be, you know, uh, I would double-check uh, where, the, where the chin sort of juts out, like where exactly is that point in relation to the corner of the mouth, and by using all of these relationships um, of, of parts to each other, that's how I would work my way uh, through the drawing. That's just what's comfortable to me. But I do think it's really useful to know about these different methods. And I think there's, um, there's a great deal of benefit, especially if you're starting to do, uh, to do people and to do, um, or maybe just drawing in general, to either using the site size method while you're, where you're trying to draw something at exactly the same size that you visually see it, or where you've printed out something and you're trying to, to duplicate it, because that takes the business of your brain having to, to resize everything. It takes that whole problem away. Um, in general, though, as you know, I, I prefer that copying isn't what you do when you are actually doing your own artwork. Um, so that kind of gets me to just sort of talking about academic drawing in general. So a lot of these uh, ateliers or studios have been set up recently to bring back some of these studies that were done, um, you know, hundreds of years ago or even decades ago, where drawing very, very carefully from, from plaster casts or from the model was done with a great deal of concentration on getting everything exact. Um, so whether they were using the site size method or whether they were gridding up, or whether, or however they were doing it, it was the accuracy of duplication that was important. And this was often what an art student would do for the year, first couple of years before they started learning how to paint, because it trains your eye. It trains your eye to be able to um, look at something and then make that same thing happen over here on your page or on your canvas. After you've got that ability, then you can look at something that's smaller or larger or whatever, and it's easier to, to then uh, you know, duplicate it in your drawing or your painting, or with freedom, with the freedom of your own personal expression. So it, it can be difficult if you start down that more academic drawing or painting um, road. To get to that point, though, where you do let go of that really strict adherence to copying and to making it look exactly like what you see. It can be difficult to then let your imagination go and do something that's a bit more free, like this drawing right here. So I like to show people both methods, and, and next week we'll be doing some academic drawing ourselves, um, as well as the, as the three-color method. But I think it's really good, kind of like a buffet, to sample a lot of different ways, ways to draw ways to measure, uh, you know, ways to, um, to reproduce things, different styles, and sort of see what you personally like. Um, it is very likely to be different from what I like or what somebody else likes. All right, so just a few more minutes here, and we'll go ahead and, and wrap this up for today.
Oh, this is a really good question. Someone is using the pen and ink um, and using a dip pen. The pen doesn't hold a lot of ink and um, they have to dip every uh, two seconds or so. You know, this is, this is really an interesting problem. What I, what I tend to do is I dip that pen nib in pretty far so that I get a good sort of blob of ink um, behind the nib. There is, this takes some practice. Um, I then blot just a tiny bit of the front of the pen nib. Um, take, I get a little bit of that ink uh, off, so I don't, have, I don't have too much. I don't want it to all blob and run down at, at, at the front, but it allows me to do more pen strokes that way. So it, this is a matter of practice. <laughs> and unfortunately, part of the mat matter of practice is also that you will have some times when you have too much ink and, and you're pre you press too hard with that nib and too much of that ink sort of shoots down the end and, and comes out. But if you practice just putting that pen nib in a little bit further, getting a little bit more ink on there, you'll be able to make it your strokes last longer. And another thing that I, I find when I do use a dip pen is as I'm starting to run out of ink, that's when I do some of those finer lines. Um, so I might then go in and do some of those lines around the face when I don't have, when I'm, when I'm almost ready to run out of ink, when I don't have so much left, because then there's not, there's much less chance that I'm just going to blob that thing. All right, let's go ahead and, and wrap up um, with the idea that I'm going to um, send you this image and you can, you can give it a shot. Um, I'm so pleased that we've got some people who are trying the dip pen because that is a, I mean, that is a beautiful effect. It takes a little while to get control and to figure out, um, you know, for your pen nibs, whether they're, you know, small or large or whatever you're doing, you know, just how to do it in a, in an easy manner. Isn't it crazy to think that everybody use those for writing and drawing um, you know, uh, across the board at, at one particular point? So when you look at something like this that Charles Dana Gibson did, here's a guy who spent a lot of time using um, a dip pen and would have been really uh, familiar with its properties. So we're diving in, um, you know, uh, wanting to do something like this, but, but starting in a, in a way that uh, he probably couldn't have imagined that nobody would really have had that familiarity with those sorts of pens. Okay, let's wrap up. I'm going to stop uh, screen sharing. I think that was, oh, nope, I've got one more thing to say. Oh. Okay, so just to wrap up, pen and ink, places and people. So using cross hatching, uh, hatching, stippling, which is just little dots to get a range of values. That's really how we do it with pen and ink. Um, never feel that it's cheating or anything like that to use a light pencil sketch first to establish the layout. Everybody does it. Um, every illustrator, every, every artist I've shown you uh, did a layout in pencil um, to get started. Um, varying the stroke and the weight of the line, the direction of the line, the pen nib, these are all ways to add that excitement and energy to your pen and ink drawing. Um, and less is more. It is better to have fewer lines and leave things out. Now, someone like Charles Dana Gibson, obviously he had great command of, of his values and how he was going to work like that fellow in the chair. But if you're not sure about it, go for less. Otherwise, you'll just end up with this, this very large, very dark thing. <laughs> so you want to be able to show those difference in values. Um, take time to look at uh, the scene, uh, especially in pen and ink. You don't have to draw everything that you see. If, you, if you're outside and you want to draw one plant or just a section of a plant, uh, that can be a way to practice this technique without having to take in the whole outdoors. Um, and look for look for the curves your lines can follow, especially on people. You know, the can can curves go around the arm, for example, around the wrist, around the neck, um, up the sides of, of the of the face to get a feeling of softness without just drawing one line, uh, which would be more like a comic book, for example. And of course, a viewfinder and a quick no tan are useful if you're doing a scene to edit out things that are going to get in the way. And you can use those nice darks, just like with charcoal, to play up contrast and to get rid of too much detail if you think it's distracting. All right. Very good, folks. That was excellent. You made it through people in pen and ink. <laughs> so, 
you know, once again, we're, we're not able to always get to, you know, to a point where we're going to just sort of keep working on more pen and ink and this, that, and the other. We're going to switch now and we're going to go uh, back to another drawing method that uses shading with the trois couleurs and uh, see how that goes next week. But I hope you're seeing how drawing is drawing and they really kind of build on top of each other. And it's just a matter of practicing as many methods as we are. Like I said last week, we're trying to make up for a good 70 years of lost information. So we, we look back to those um, folks in the early uh, 1900s, mid 1900s, and look for their techniques and, and the tricks and such that they used. So thanks so much, folks. If you have any questions or anything you want to email me about, erwhelan at gmail.com. I'll send this PDF around and, and put the uh, video up. But keep on drawing. Draw on. <laughs>